Well, good morning, everyone. Happy weekend to you. We are well and truly into autumn, midway through March. Uh, it is election day, okay? For those of you who are locals in South Australia, don't forget to get out and vote today. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll see a wind of change, much needed change blow through. Not that I'm telling you who to vote for, of course, I, I'd, I'd never <coughs> encourage that. But uh, we are into week number seven of our chronological Bible reading plan, which means basically we are uh, one seventh of the way through. So congratulations if you've lasted this long, that's fantastic. Uh, we are about to finish off our first week, okay, of readings uh, and uh, we are well and truly into the Torah, the books of Moses that open up our Bible. We're going to finish Exodus this week, uh, the last two chapters, which is basically where the tabernacle has been finished uh, building, okay, the tent, the sanctuary that they've been building for the last few chapters, all that's finished right in time for the one year anniversary of the crossing of the Red Sea, okay, so it's basically the, the book of Exodus spans a year effectively, okay, and God comes upon the tabernacle in the last chapter as a great sign of endorsement, all right, it's basically God's way of saying, I'm with you, well done. The cloud of God's glory comes and endorses what Moses and all his crew have been doing. And then we get into the book of Leviticus. Leviticus follows immediately after Exodus. There's no time break in between. And Leviticus is written, as the name suggests, if you pay attention, to the Levites. Okay, Leviticus is basically Leviticus. All right, that's who it's written to. It's written to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, remember, is Moses' brother, and they are from the tribe of Levi, 12 tribes, okay, the tribe of Levi, and God chooses that tribe to become priests. And so Leviticus is a whole book written to the priests. Exodus, or the last part of Exodus, is about setting up the tabernacle. Leviticus is about running the tabernacle. It's all basically one big instruction book. It's the instruction manual, okay, that comes with how to run this new thing, this new toy. No, 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 not a toy. This new thing that God has given us. Leviticus is the whole book of instructions. It's basically one big rule book, which sounds a little boring, which it is. <clears throat> but to add a spice to it, it's a book full of blood and fire. And so let me serve as a bit of a, this serves as a bit of a trigger warning to you this week. As you read this instruction book, there's a lot of blood and a lot of burning that's involved. And while that sounds a little bit gross, here's why. I hope this autumn wind isn't too loud for you. You can still hear me. Here's why. When the law of God came and God establishes this old covenant, we don't really understand this until the first century when Hebrews and Paul the Apostle really brings this out. But one of the main reasons that the law covenant was given was to help God's people. This sounds crazy, but just hear this. To help God's people focus on sin. To help God's people be more aware of the power of sin in their life. And that is really brought out in the book of Leviticus. Yes, there are offerings and there are sacrifices that are about removing sin and the penalty for sin, etc., etc. But as you read this book, you, you can understand how these people develop a heightened awareness and therefore a heightened culture of what we might call sin consciousness, being aware of impurity, being aware of uncleanliness, being aware of what's unholy. And it affects every aspect of their life. It affects their clothing. It affects their, the animals that they eat or aren't allowed to eat and how they eat and what happens when it's you know that time of the month and what happens if mildew gl gr grows on their clothing. I mean, all these rules, which you, you're going to read this week and you're going to go, what the heck is the deal with that? Well, this is what I'm trying to give you a heads up. This whole book is designed to help God's people see the power of sin. And this is why, and that sounds crazy, but remember, by the first century, we understand why. We understand on this side of the cross that the whole reason the law was given, Romans, Paul brings this out in Romans, in the opening chapters particularly, the reason that the law was given was to make people so aware of sin that when the Savior came, it would be such a relief, such a release from being free from the overwhelming power of sin. 
the power of sin heightens, was designed to anyway, the, the idea of God's holiness in their mind. And that is part of the reason for Leviticus and what this whole Levitical system of worship does. And so because of that, unfortunately for you and I, and I just want to give you a bit of a warning without trying to bring a damper on the whole thing, okay? Unfortunately for you and I, it makes Leviticus, let's be honest, difficult to read. It, it's not a feel-good book, all right? It's not a feel-good book because it focuses on sin all the time. And you may find that a little depressing. And secondly, what makes Leviticus a bit difficult to read is it is difficult in the initial stages to see how the heck it is relevant to you and I. I mean, in one sense, the good thing about Levitical law is that it highlights the, uh, this, the value of personal responsibility. And hey, we're having an election this week, so let's talk about it. In politics, in culture, I personally think that law, a law that encourages personal responsibility for one's actions, that is a pretty good thing. It's held Western society in good stead because of our Judeo-Christian ethic of personal responsibility. That has held our society in pretty good stead over the years. And so that is part of what the book of Leviticus does. But otherwise, it's a three and a half thousand year old rule book that does not apply to you and me. It's not written to us. You're not a Levite. I'm not a Levite. The, the tabernacle's no longer standing. And all these rituals and rules and regulations, you and I know, we don't apply them. You're not going to come to church this Sunday and offer a dove and a pigeon and a goat because this book is not written to you. So sometimes it's hard to read Leviticus because you think, how does it, where does it apply to me at all? Here's my encouragement to you this week. I want you to read Leviticus and I want you to set your mind on discovering him. Discover him. Listen to this. You've never heard me say this before. Discover him. What that means, first of all, is this. Keep your head, keep your eyes focused on the historical intended meaning of the text. Look for him. The historical intended meaning. H-I-M. What does what I'm reading mean? It has a historical meaning. And what it means historically is that the Levites of three and a half thousand years ago were to practically put these things in place. That is good exegesis. The historical intended meaning. Look for that. But secondly, looking for him means this. Look for Jesus. Because as you and I know, on this side of the cross, on this side of history, the things that were written historically to the people of ancient Israel have a significant spiritual application and outworking for us today. No, we are not going to physically apply the instructions in Leviticus. But the things that are described in Leviticus to that historical context have spiritual, substantive, and significant implications for you and I today because Jesus is the, provides the substance to the shadows and types of what you and I will read this week. The sacrifices, the offerings, the blood offerings and worship, you and I will never do those things physically because they've been fulfilled in Him. So pay attention to finding Jesus in the text this week. The way that priests are dressed, their robes, their, uh, the 12 tribes on Aaron's vest, okay? You and I will never dress like that. It's not written to us. It has a historical intended meaning that was relevant to the people 3,000 years ago. We will never fulfill these scriptures practically, but we do see significance in them spiritually because Jesus is our high priest. And so as you read about Aaron, the high priest, see if you can discover him. See if you can discover Jesus and how Jesus fulfilling that shadow is relevant to you and I today. It's basically the way you're supposed to read Leviticus as a Christian. It has a historical meaning, okay? And that meaning is set in history. 
but it has a substantial significance to us today if we can discover Jesus. We can see in, 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 in Leviticus the types and shadows that point us towards the reality of Jesus Christ. I hope that gives you some encouragement today because otherwise Leviticus is a pretty hard read, but you can do it, okay? It's only 17 chapters this week or 18 chapters, whatever it is that's on your sheet, okay? Uh, I think it's chapter 1 through the 18. Where is it? Yep, the first 18 chapters and then we'll finish it off next week. Bless you guys. Have an awesome weekend and uh, thanks for keeping up with these videos. I'll see you next week. Bye.